You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Heart Matters, where leading cardiology experts explore the latest trends, technologies, and clinical developments in cardiology practice. Your host for Heart Matters is Dr. Doug Weaver, immediate past president of the American College of Cardiology. The performance of percutaneous coronary intervention without surgical backup has been a long-produced controversy. In recent years, off-site angioplasty has become more common, and the clinical evidence demonstrates comparable outcomes for on-site and off-site procedures. How does this shift allow us to serve a broader patient population? Will guidelines change to reflect some of these new findings? Our guest today is Dr. Spencer King, president of St. Joseph's Heart and Vascular Institute in Atlanta and professor of medicine emeritus at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. King is also a past president of the American College of Cardiology. Welcome, Spencer. Thanks, Doug. Good to be here. Many states now have no requirements for on-site surgery. I think it's in the neighborhood of 25, 26 states. And can you bring the audience up a little bit to date? What's going on as far as the need for bypass surgery in the setting of angioplasty? Sure. Well, with the development of angioplasty, of course, the procedure was considered pretty risky. And as a matter of fact, when we started angioplasty at Emory in 1980, we were sending about 6% of the patients direct to surgery from the cath lab. So in that setting, you had to have surgery available all the time. As time has gone on, angioplasty has become more reliable, primarily because of stenting and the ability of the stent to hold the artery open and obviate the need for surgery for the acutely closed artery. So that's dropped down, and from the national data from the NCDR and so forth, it's down around half a percent or some places up to 1%. So this is an unusual occurrence to have to go for emergency surgery. Still in the guidelines, the surgery has been recommended as being either available in the hospital or where it's not to have very tight control zone ability to get to surgery because when the complication occurs needing surgery, of course, it is very important to be able to get there. The thing that has driven the move toward uh, establishing some sites without surgery, there are a couple of things. One is the need for, the main thing primarily, is the need for uh, angioplasty availability in the setting of acute myocardial infarction. In order to try to have primary angioplasty for acute myocardial infarction available, it was not possible to have surgical programs set up at all the hospitals that might provide that. So that's been the major driving factor in the establishment of these kind of programs. In some states, they've taken the law off uh, completely. Other states still require surgical availability in the hospital where PCI is being done. And in some states, there are experimental programs allowing some places to establish those kind of programs. I'm involved in one of those in New York State where that is done, and Massachusetts recently has done the same thing, to try to study this issue of whether you can safely do PCI in hospitals without surgery. You know, some of the physicians would argue that you kind of need to do this more than just in the setting of primary angioplasty to put your team and system together in the hospital. Um, is that a real concern? Yeah, that's the catch-22 of all this. Clearly, for elective procedures, just as elective surgery, it's not medically problematic for patients to move to hospitals where PCI is done. So the question then is, okay, to have a PCI available for the acute infarction nearby the patient, how does the hospital maintain the competence? How do the operators maintain their skills? And the hospital cath labs remain tuned up to do those primary angioplasties if they don't do angioplasty on a regular basis. So there is a problem of economic problem as well, uh, equipping the hospital, equipping the cath labs, only for a primary acute infarction angioplasty. And so hospitals that do that have pressed very hard to be allowed to do elective angioplasty. And there are two views of that. One is, yes, that's very helpful, and if those programs develop and they have good triage and select the right cases for their elective angioplasty, then they stay tuned up and ready to do the acute infarctions. The other side of that coin is that hospitals that are primarily organized to do acute infarction angioplasty may do primary angioplasty to stay in practice, if you will, 
for doing the acute infarctions and that the only rationale for doing the electives is just to stay in practice. Now, that is a strong reason to monitor these kind of programs and make sure that if elective angioplasty is being done, the two things are being met. One is the appropriateness is very clear that uh, these are patients who, in fact, should be having angioplasty. And secondly, that the kind of cases selected are appropriate for that. And there are certain cases that should never be attempted without the availability of potential urgent surgery. But the majority of cases, of course, are lower acuity and could be perhaps uh, undertaken in a well-developed and well-monitored programs uh, without any surgery immediately available. Yeah, I was going to ask you a little bit about can doctors actually predict who's likely to get a complication? I remember seeing one paper from Mayo in which a satellite hospital had very strict criteria about who would get elective angioplasty done in that setting because they did not have surgical backup. Does this totally obviate the need for emergent surgery or not? No, it doesn't. And the rules where this is seriously undertaken usually require close cooperation with a surgical center where patients could be transferred quickly if needed. It's not always possible to tell who's going to get in trouble. Sometimes the uh, patient who uh, appeared to have a very simple problem ends up with a tamponade or ends up with a acutely closed artery or something else that was not expected. So it's unusual, but surprises do happen. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD Radio XM 160 the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Doug Weaver. Our guest today is Dr. Spencer King, president of the St. Joseph's Heart and Vascular Institute in Atlanta and professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine. We are discussing percutaneous coronary angioplasty without surgical backup. Spencer, if it is going to be done in centers like this, Should there be minimum requirements for the operators and the numbers of cases that are done in those centers? I strongly believe there should be. And again, in my role with the New York State Cardiac Advisory Board and Registry, we have instituted such rules. So we have a little tighter criteria, actually, for the operators working in centers without surgical availability and also minimum standards for volume of activity. But I would stress that when there are low-volume operations going on, it is very important to have systems in place to monitor the appropriateness and the outcomes because in large-volume operations, you can sometimes depend on the statistics, but when you get down to smaller volume, you have to look carefully at the unique events to make sure that you're doing the right thing. So one of the things we're hearing is that it's good to participate in registries like the college's. NCDR, so you're getting back regular reports to know uh, what your outcomes are from these procedures. I think this is becoming the standard. The other question I have is that I know in uh, my own state of Michigan, and I think in other states, is that there's no doubt that tertiary care is spreading out to many of the suburban hospitals. For one reason or another, and many times it's for patient convenience and their wants, they want this kind of care closer to their homes. Now, in our own state, which requires a surgical backup, what's happened is that in order to do a respectable number of angioplasties, which is possible in many of these suburban hospitals, they're putting in surgical programs. But as you know, the use of surgery has dropped dramatically over the last decade or so. And so they're actually diluting the surgical experience at some of the large centers. So I'd like you to comment on this. Yes. Well, in fact, there are not enough surgeons to have surgical centers everywhere. And even if there were, there would not be enough volume to maintain the kind of quality that everybody insists on. And that's what drives the move toward more interventional sites. The problem with creating unlimited number of interventional sites for elective work is that all of them become fairly low-volume operations. Now, by selecting carefully, PCI can be performed in many of these places quite nicely and even with modest experience. But as PCI begins to displace surgery in some of the more complex situations, and I'll reflect for a moment on the Syntex trial done mostly in Europe but also some in the U.S., this trial of multivessel disease putting in 4.5 stents per case 
these kind of procedures, expanding to left main stenting, expanding to triple vessel stenting, these kind of situations uh, require a lot of planning. Total occlusion cases require a lot of experience. So when we say, yes, PCI can be done safely, the other part of that is, is the selection for PCI and surgery entirely appropriate for the complex lesions, complex patients, in places without large experience, both surgical and interventional? So there is a problem of unlimited expansion of PCI, as has occurred in some states and in some metropolitan areas where you really can't find a high-volume institution with extensive experience. So there's arguments to be made. The main argument to be made for dissemination of sites is the availability of emergency angioplasty for heart attacks, for acute infarction. The main argument for regionalization is to maintain highly experienced centers that deal with the more complex situations. Now, I'd like you to make some predictions regarding the future guidelines, sort of taking all of this into context. Regarding the role, I guess, of doing angioplasty without on-site surgery, and then I hear you alluding to, if this is going to go forward, there should be fairly strict indications about what should and should not be done in those kinds of settings. Is that true? Yes, it is, and there is a focused update of the PCI guidelines that is beginning now to be developed, and I don't want to prejudge what the conclusions will be, but certainly issues mainly to be addressed will be the new trials that have come out in the meantime since the last focused update. Things like Horizon AMI, things like uh, Syntex will be considered, but also issues such as minimum volume standards, which probably will be reconsidered to some degree, and the practice at hospitals without surgery on site may be some of the issues evaluated, because there are likely to be some shifts in the guideline recommendations. And as those are considered, some of those things will require, as PCI becomes more successful, in more complex cases, the operator experience must be considered so that we've got really the right procedure for the right patient situation. What data is being collected right now that's going to help us a little bit in making these decisions? You alluded to a study going on in New York. There is a study that is currently in press from New York. There's a study from acute infarction patients from Massachusetts I'm aware of. Perhaps Michigan, you have knowledge about that. Certainly, they've done very nice registry data in Michigan as well, some others. But there are some studies comparing these things. One of the things that I think we should be careful about is it's very hard to control, in these registries, it's very hard to control for all the variables. And the question is, which cases are selected for the off-site interventions? which cases are selected only to be done in hospitals with surgical availability. And in the setting of the acute infarction, there is some early evidence that patients done in sites without surgery availability, even though they may have comparable initial outcomes, end up with more repeat procedures to take care of other arteries, whereas in the sites with surgery availability, may have more extensive and complete procedures initially. So these are all considerations, and it'll have to be considered. Probably never completely solved as far as confounders in, in the selection process. But I think the bottom line is that programs that undertake interventions without a surgical availability need to have excellent data and need to be very concerned about the appropriateness of the procedures and the outcomes of those procedures, not only acutely, but what goes on over the next months and years so that you make sure the long-term outcomes and results are, are also comparable to more experienced centers. We've been talking with Dr. Spencer King, taking a closer look at PCI procedures without surgical backup. Dr. King, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You've been listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. For more information on this week's show or to download a podcast of this segment, please visit us at ReachMD.com. Thank you for listening.